Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We're gathered together here today in a very special kind of an AA meeting. One that was dreamed up by my friends at the headquarters. And the uh, thought was that we would discuss the AA traditions. Uh, I like this idea because, as you know, it's been impossible for Lois and me to travel extensively in AA and to contact you as we used to. It stri- strikes us. Uh, that films of this sort may be the very best bet. Of course, one thing I like about this AA meeting, in particular, is that I am assigned to do all of the talking. Uh, I still have some vestiges of ego. Speaking of ego, this had a great deal to do with the formation of AA's tradition in the first place. As every AA knows, we shall always be threatened by menacing forces within, and certainly in the world of great peril in which we live today, by menacing forces without. So, a very prime problem, the prime problem of AA is first how to survive, and then to grow and prosper in numbers and in spiritual substance over the years to come. As practically every hearer knows, the traditions are the application of AA's 12 steps, the spirit of those steps, to the practical problems of living and working together as a harmonious society, of rightly relating ourselves to those forces which have so often torn societies apart, the problems of money, problems of power, our prestige, our management of properties, and so on. As I look over the list of traditions, I am frankly flabbergasted at the choices, apparently rather successful choices of principles that we have made. I might remind you that the AA's 12 Steps to Recovery, first appearing in 1939 in the big book, are now 30 years old. And they have served us extremely well. The traditions now approach 25 years since their publication in 46. And they too have served us well. And while there is great room for interpretation of these principles and the applications are Innumerable. The solid substance of each remains still about as written. So these are reassuring facts about the tradition. People, in looking at the traditions, find very clear statements, and yet, paradoxically, some of them are baffling. Newcomers ask these questions. They say, what do you mean? There are no rules, regulations here? What do you mean? I'm a member if I say so. What do you mean? Nobody is, can run this thing permanently? What do you mean? There are no penalties or punishments? What do you mean? There's no public controversy. Every society is mixed up with public controversy. And drunk for love to controversy. What do you mean, no controversy? Et cetera, et cetera. 
So, the thing that is not so well understood among AA generally and among our friends is why we selected these particular principles and how they came into being. And few at this time, uh, now that we are of this age, remember today the tremendous struggles that we had among us in trying to come to these decisions. And because I occupied a place, happening to be uh, the number one elder in the thing, and Dr. Bob number two, we were especially in the middle of all of this. Now, Dr. Bob was inherently a much more spiritually qualified person than I. And very naturally, because he was a doctor, he took to this marvelous 12-step job along with Ignatia out there. And he very cheerfully turned over to me uh, the writing and the speaking and the headquarters in New York and that sort of thing. We had a division of labor. So that I especially was subjected to very great personal temptation. In other words, most of these traditions actually run counter to some of my early and sometimes secret aims. And some of this stuff I'd like to share with you because it is relevant to all who follow us also. This is, this, these temptations will recur time and time and time again. So, I think that perhaps I'd like to share some of this sort of thing with you. Against this background, let's have a look at the 12 traditions themselves. Here's the first one. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. This is a prudent reminder Indeed, it is a stern warning that unless AA continues to live, the greater part of us would surely die. And so would the countless alcoholics that we might have helped. This is why the general welfare must come first. Without unity and harmonious action, we shall have nothing at all. I can make no more effective statement about the welfare tradition than the one to be seen in our AA publication, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, as a suitable preamble, setting the pitch and tone of the discussion to follow. Let me share this with you. The unity of Alcoholics Anonymous is the most cherished quality that our society has. Our lives, the lives of all to come, depend squarely upon us. We stay whole or AA dies. Without unity, the heart of AA would cease to beat. Our world arteries would no longer carry the life-giving grace of God. His gift to us would be spent aimlessly. Back again in their cave, alcoholics would reproach us and say, what a great thing AA might have been. Every AA member knows that he has to conform to the principles of recovery. His life actually depends upon obedience to spiritual principles. If he deviates too far, the penalty is sure and swift. He sickens and finally dies. At first in AA, he goes along because he must. But later on, he discovers a way of life he really wants to live. Moreover, he finds he cannot keep this priceless gift unless he gives it away. Neither he nor anyone else can survive unless the AA message is perished. The moment the 12-step work forms a group, another discovery is made that most individuals cannot even recover unless there is a group. Realization dawns on the individual that he is but a small part of the great whole. 
that no personal sacrifice is too great for preservation of this fellowship. He learns that the clamor of desires and ambitions within him must be silent whenever these could damage the group. It becomes plain that the group must survive or the individual will not. So it has been with AA. By faith and by work, we have been able to build upon the lessons of an incredible experience. These live today in the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, God willing, shall sustain us in unity for so long as he may need it. See, our original function had to do with people who started groups. Naturally, Dr. Bob became, you might say, the parent of the Anchor Group. I became the parent of the uh, New York Group. And uh, there was Clarence in Cleveland, and there was Earl in Chicago, and Cliff at Los Angeles. And all of these people became founders of AA in their several localities. And very naturally, there being no other way, they got a few people sobered up after a long and strenuous tussle. These first people became a team in the structural sense. You might almost call this a, a local pulp and a hierarchy. And this was the top of the AA pyramid to come. The top was built first. And as the pyramid grew in, uh, in its base, and more and more people came in, the old-timers continued to give spiritual instruction. They either had meetings in their homes or tended to making arrangements. When publicity turned up, they took charge. In other words, they were actually managing the affairs of an infant or adolescent family. And this was just as it should be. But there was a change in this this situation. When AA got further spread and rapidly spread, the first by the Plain Dealer articles uh, in Cleveland, and then by Mr. Rockefeller's dinner, and finally, the great smash of the Saturday Post piece of 1941, which brought us 6,000 new members within a year's time. Then you had the same phenomena, excepting that local founders, not all of them being models of stability, couldn't last very long. And uh, more and more, there was a disposition in these large masses of AAs to ask, well, these old-timers are all well and good, but are they going to run things forever? And this was a very disconcerting pressure to Dr. Bob and me, and particularly to some of these old-timers. Because we were the first two on the scene, it seems that we had a quality of lasting longer than the others. In fact, I only bowed out just in time here a few years ago, and death took Dr. Bob. But at any rate... This was the fundamental of it. So that you began to develop the group which said, in effect, you old-timers ought to get over on the sideline. And those of you that we like and respect, we are going to continue to consult. And those of you who are still, let us say, somewhat undeveloped, we shall label bleeding D. Well... This injected a new thing. On top of this pyramid of service, now cut off across the top, there appeared something for each group that whizzed round and round and changed personnel every few months, lest anybody get too much power. It was called a rotating committee. And at the group level, this was fine, and it was easy for the groups, knowing everybody at hand, to, to name successful group committees that acted exactly in a town meeting fashion. Well, then some years later, as 
urban problems got to be tremendous, and there had to be some headwork tail away. Eh? Uh, when they got into that phase, they found immense difficulty for the, all of these urban people, or even representatives of them, to get together to choose people, a committee, to manage and conduct an intergroup office. Uh, this was a very difficult business. Uh, in fact, I can think of one town that, where the confusion was so great that you had four or five competing uh, old-timers with telephone numbers, each of which announced that this is AA, not the other one, this one is. Now, when they came to put in an office, the schisms in the town were so bad that they actually had to draw lots to get the first office management out. Well, that wasn't such a, a great success because it stopped a political clamor, but at the same time, it didn't furnish the office with the best possible top management. But little by little, the intergroup management still remained basically democratic in its structure. The group representatives had all the ultimate power, but the committee managing the office could nominate its successors on the theory that they would know the people of the kind of skills required that would be necessary, and that if the meeting of the group representatives, local ones, didn't agree, they could name their own man still. They held the ultimate power, but this began to make room for something that we now call the trusted servant in, in, in the AA tradition, too. The discovery that you couldn't operate AA in a large urban area on a purely town meeting basis. It was simply too big. Let alone could you operate AA services worldwide. I mean, you couldn't elect a bunch of trustees to serve here in New York by put, putting out some names and a slate to vote on all over the world. As you can see, it wouldn't work. So that after a while, though the ultimate power always continued to remain in the group, the structure always turned out the same, that servants of the more important services were picked partly by appointment always subject to check with the group conscience. And in that way, we could get people who were required to do the particular job, had the skills, people of excellence for the position. And that's how the structure evolved. Now, parallel to all this, and in fact commencing before it, we had a similar structure for world service down here. That finally evolved, although this took many years to complete it. Uh, many AAs will remember that in 1938 we incorporated something called the Alcoholic Foundation. And among other things, the foundation took up over the book Alcoholics Anonymous, which has been published and financed separately, and therefore it took the trustees who were composed of non-alcoholics and a few alcoholics, chosen really by Dr. Bob and me. Uh, they, they, they took over the title to our literature, and we opened a little office, and when the Saturday Post piece came on with all this great flood of inquiries, we cleared most of them, and then we began to get into problems of public relations and all of the things that the World Office does today. And uh, these were all, without exception, chores that could not be performed in many locations. There had to be some head or tail of literature. There had to be some place and somehow of... <laughs> a lot of other services. You could, uh, there had to be some head and tail to public relations. Policies had to be devised and all this sort of thing. Well, for many years, I suppose partly because Bob and I had set it up that way, way back in 38, before there were any intergroup, this thing refused, at this end, here in New York, refused to involve, evolve. 
partly because it was felt that since the groups were having such a hard time uh, to even have a clubhouse without a furor or to manage their simple affairs, how could we possibly bring traditions to, to bear on this situation down here? The operation had been very successful. Our friends in the majority on the board, non-alcoholics as a protection to the vagaries of people like Dr. Me and Bob and me and other trust, alcoholic trustees, well, this was all in part. So what would we do? It took from 1945, just after the tradition came out, to 1951 to persuade everybody concerned that as an experiment, a conference of delegates should be called, at least from the United States and Canada, properly weighted according to population in each locality, to come down here and to take a look at these services, which we who had been uh, running them all these years felt had been invaluable to AA and might have been accountable for one half of our growth and a great deal of unit. So this is how the group conscience came into being. And this is what we mean by AA's trusted servants. Special people selected for their special abilities, but never people who shall govern. Now we come to Tradition 3, dealing with this very important matter of membership. We alcoholics have been an ostracized people. Sometimes we have been actual prisoners of society. At all times, we have been prisoners of ourselves, you might say. So when AA proffers its hand to the alcoholic, what does the alcoholic want? He wants freedom. He wants to belong. So therefore, we have tried to reduce every possible resistance that he might have. He is generally sore at religion. He is sore at medicine. He is sore at the science. Perhaps at a distance he has heard that AA is another religious organization and complains that the missions did him in and made him work. So when he arrives and finds that it is a fact that AA's only require for member, requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. His relief is a mess. When he is told that there is a spiritual quality about AA, but this requires no theology or religious belief in the ordinary sense, that the group can be his higher power, then his release and his freedom knows no bound, and he plunges in to the new stream that comes out into a happier and sober life. So therefore, we should keep this door wide open. We cannot put any strictures, and we bind ourselves not upon it. We cannot compel the new man to believe anything, to pay anything, to do anything. We actually invite him to disagree with everything we say. And still, if he wishes to stay around, he's an AA if he says so. This is the charter of individual freedom that is portrayed in this most important tradition of three, dealing with membership. Just as tradition three is a charter for individual freedom, so is tradition four a charter, really, for group freedom. It poses the question, when is an AA group? Does it have any limitations upon its liberty? And we say, no, each AA group, like the individual, 
has a right to be wrong. The only thing that we ask but do not demand of a group trying for sobriety who wish to call themselves AA is that they do not publicly mingle the AA name with some other enterprise. Quite obviously, nobody would be very interested, and it would be a great brewer of trouble were we to talk about Protestant groups and Catholic groups and Republican groups and communist AA groups. This would be absurd and troublemaking on the face of it. So long as their primary purpose is directed towards sobriety and they don't get us married to anyone else, this is our only requirement. Otherwise, they can have it just the way they want. And the group itself, you must remember from position two, is the ultimate seat of authority for the whole movement. So that even in a town meeting democracy, the strictures upon such bodies are much greater than they are upon an AA group. It is a vast expanse and charter of liberty indeed, and we know that we are safe in granting because too much departure from our traditional principles or from the 12 steps brings its own pressures and punishments. Leave it to John Barleycorn to take care of the foolish dissent. Meanwhile, let's chart our groups for liberty as well as the individual. This is autonomy. Now that we've considered group autonomy or self-direction, and we have said that every group has a right to be wrong, Strangely enough, Tradition 5 centers on the single purpose of the ideal AA group. And the single purpose tradition has had a long history of conflict. You will remember that back in 1938, when our trusteeship was set up, the original incorporation empowered AA and its trustees to participate in any and all aspects of the alcohol field, excepting, I believe, to lobby for prohibition. Uh, at that time, it was supposed that we should have our own chain of hospitals and that we should have halfway houses financed by AA as such, and we needed rest farms and we needed to, to get into education because, after all, who know better about these matters than us drunk. But long, long experience has told us that for practical reasons, reasons of safety, reasons of protection against compromising our energy, and for reasons of self-protection, and for reasons of love, for all of these reasons, each AA group ought to confine itself to its single purpose. To read the tradition, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Immediately, person, people will say, but why shouldn't we be in these other enterprises? The fact is that each of us needs AA work for his own survival. We need to avoid complications and distractions. So we continue to point at the single purpose to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Now, another reason for the single purpose is our unique value to the alcoholic who still suffers. This cannot yet be duplicated by any other group or any approach. And thus far, it has brought sobriety in 15,000 groups to maybe 500,000 AA members. Our assignment is still enormous, just on this single purpose line. With our present membership, if only we could get alcoholics to approach us, if only professional people having alcoholics in charge would allow us to assist, 
instead of sobering up 20,000 drunks a year with the 12-step work that we do, we could just as well be sobering up 100,000 alcoholics per year. And God knows this is an assignment big enough. And we are uniquely fitted to do this by ourselves or still better by cooperation with other agencies. So I think that now there is no doubt that every AA group will choose to stick to its primary purpose. AA members participate in other activities as members, as citizens. This is fine, too. But as groups, as a fellowship, national and international, let us cleave to our single purpose. Let that old-fashioned adage, shoemaker, stick to thy last, be our primary direction in this matter hereafter. Let's move on to Tradition 6, which reads as follows. An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Now, this tradition is a great departure from our original views. And in the middle 1940s, we still thought that for good enterprises, the AA name ought to be available if they were primarily conducted with a, by AA members. And so, with my full consent, we lent the AA name to an educational enterprise carried on by a great friend of mine. And the first effect of this was very good. In those days, of course, we hoped for more and more publicity. And when she went on the road uh, educating the public, uh, opening other facilities, she got a great lot of publicity, which brushed off on us because she had declared herself publicly as an AA member. Now, there were other instances of this, uh, which were really menacing, where people borrowed the AA name, broke the anonymity at the public level, and therefore were in full cry to get us married to all sorts of other enterprises. And so by 1950, we had seen the extreme peril of giving endorsements to the public level or of AA uh, members breaking the anonymity to the public level and trying to draw the AA endorsement over onto enterprises of their own uh, for purposes of raising money and all that's publicity. So that became crystal clear. Now we have a Tradition 7 called Every AA Group Ought to Be Fully Self-Supporting, Declining Outside Contributions. Well, this look, took a long time for us to change our minds about. Uh, when our foundation, now the General Service Board, was first set up, we thought in terms of very large funds and thought ourselves very fortunate in getting some of Mr. John D. Rockefeller's friends to serve on the board, not only because they were deeply interested, but because it seemed an avenue to funds, which certainly Mr. Rockefeller would supply. For a while, it looked like he would supply our newly formed foundation funds, especially when in the spring of 1940, two years after it started, he suddenly announced that he would like to give a dinner and invite his friends to hear the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, sure enough, the night came. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller represented his father, who turned out to be sick. Uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick appeared. And a great many notables in finance and in other activities in and about New York. 
and there were in the room at least a billion dollars of capital. And we who were still very broke, of course, expected that, uh, you know, we could make even a timid bid for contributions and get a very considerable return. To our utter astonishment, following the meeting, Mr. Rockefeller wrote a letter to all who came and all who were invited and hadn't, uh, said what a remarkable thing this was, how much it represented first century Christianity, and how, in the interest of simplicity and spiritual values, it needed no money. And then he staked out a little exception, saying that a couple of the originators were still needful of a, a little help. And because of this, he was giving the movement $1,000. So each of the contrib each of the people present were impressed with the idea that no great amount of money was needed. One gave us as little as $10. <laughs> and I think the highest contribution outside of Mr. Rockefeller was $300. Subsequently, Mr. Rockefeller's friend, Willard Richardson, then on the board, called on Mr. Rockefeller and again raised this question of money. And Mr. Rockefeller said, Dick, money is going to spoil this thing. It ought to stand on its own feet. So... We can certainly credit Mr. John D. Rockefeller for a providential wisdom on behalf of AA. And he since has told the story many times, and so has Nelson, how this is the only organization that paid back money that he, he loaned us at one period <laughs> of an organization of this sort. So this is the taproot of our tradition of Every AA group should be self-supporting, declining outside contributions. We have made a rather stringent rule or custom about contributions from individuals inside AA. Our rich people in AA are very numerous. A lot of them would be disposed to send General Headquarters a lot of money. But they and the rest of us feel that we should not pass off our financial responsibility onto people less fortunate. We should share the financial responsibility, and we should not accept gifts large enough so that they would tend to buy favor for uh, trusteeships and whatnot. So the utmost that any individual can give AA today, that is any AA member, is $200 a year. All other contributions come from the groups themselves, and we have declined large sums of money from the outside, and it is my prayer that we shall always do so. Well, let us jump down to Tradition 10, the professionalism, and A is such should never be organized, have been pretty well covered directly and by inference. But here we come to Tradition 10, which says that Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Well, we've never had any great trouble along this line. And, of course, the anonymity tradition is tended to keep the lid on it. We have managed finally to re refrain from endorsements or from being compromised by our own people in that direction. So that actually this issue has never arisen. And in this sense, we are very unique among societies and nations that we're not in, we're in a position of absolute uh, neutrality as far as world and the problem, uh, problems and the problems of our community are concerned. As a society, as individuals, we take all sorts of positions on these things. But as a society, we express no opinions on these issues, and therefore we don't get into arguments. And that would, of course, be a potent source of tremendous trouble if we ever got into such arguments. And we have had, historically, 
a situation that was drawn to our attention, I think, by Milton Maxwell, a good a friend, a professor and sociologist, who once wrote up a series of pieces on the so-called Washingtonian movement. This flourished in the 1840s, and it was a society composed of alcoholics trying to help each other personally, encouraging the taking of pledges, and in, they had the benefit of the identification and some of the other attributes of AA. And I think they signed up in the first two or three years of their existence as many people as we now have in AA as recovered active members, something like a half a million. Well, this was very sensational. The prohibition movement was getting under big head of steam at the time. And there were lots of other public issues. The Civil War was ahead. Slavery was an issue. This was an issue. That was an issue. It was not long before the Washingtonians had great torchlight processions, notably in New York and Baltimore. They filled Faneuil Hall, and this was truly a great sensation of the time and extremely newsworthy. There was great pressure upon uh, Washingtonians to speak. Some turned out to be very good speakers. I believe some of them were paid speakers. But the speakers in the South were apt to get into uh, other matters than drinking, and so were they in the North. For example, the Southern speakers... Uh, didn't like the abolition idea, and the northern speakers did, so they managed to hook the poor Washingtonians into that tremendous controversy before the war. Uh, likewise, they got the Washingtonian name uh, into all sorts of enterprises. They were on both sides of the wet-dry controversy and so on. And then the process of disintegration started, uh, probably because, in part, their spiritual force generated by signing of pledges and getting together wasn't so great as ours. But very largely, it was a disintegration because they had done things that were very natural to do, but which had turned out to be so utterly destructive. And it was this spectacle of the past brought before us as our traditions were evolving that confirmed that we were probably very much on the right track in this matter of no public controversy, in this question of paying our own bills, of this question of not becoming involved with other enterprises, and so on down the line. And above all, it confirmed the great protective value of our anonymity tradition. Now we come to Tradition 11, a highly important one, which says that our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity to the level of press, radio, and film. I might remark right here that this film, by the way, is for the benefit of AAs and is not for public release. We had no public relations policy, excepting the fear of public relations, for the first two or three or four years of AA. Our societies, particularly in the West, uh, our groups, of which there were only two or three, uh, were almost secret signs. Uh, in those days, if you'd uh, posed the question of attraction versus promotion, the idea of attraction would be to sit on the front porch and wait for some drunks to come along asking for help. <laughs> uh, for example, there was severe condemnation of the people in the Philadelphia group who had gone to Curtis Bach, the owner of the Saturday Post, and had asked him, uh, would he be interested in taking a look at AA? Well, he did take a look and caused Jack Alexander to be assigned 
to do the famous March 1941 piece. Well, then, of course, the <coughs> arena was wide open to all comers and contenders. And soon we began to get AAs who were rushing to microphones, using the AA name, breaking anonymity, all for the good of the movement, because even these broken anonymity situations brought in customers. And uh, so, therefore, they were doing a good work. <clears throat> I now remember, too, that they thought that very often there should be a dual purpose here. This would be very good. I remember uh, one, some, somebody ran down south for public office on what he called the AA ticket. I believe he wanted to become a district attorney while well, he publicized AA and his good intentions politically besides. And another fellow rushed to the microphone and announced that he was soon going to produce uh, a series of talks on AA and that these would be sponsored by his employer, the Gulf Insurance Company, etc. And we had a great time finding out where attraction left off and promotion began. Well, right then, it, began, it, it, it started to be evident that this attraction and promotion business represented two poles. And taken at their extremes, the conservative rabbit on the attraction theme was so conservative that his do-nothing policies would rot us for lack, lack of action. And the promoters, if given their way, would publicize us from hell to breakfast with all of the amnesty of um, the media, plus probably sound trucks too. In other words, the conservatives would rot us and the promoters would ruin us. So that the line between attraction and promotion got to be a matter of common sense interpretation. So this is finally settled. Now, it was seen, too, that anonymity was the, the prevention of most bad publicity. Because if people didn't scramble to the microphone with these mixed motives, and we didn't go too far in the way of promotion, or too far in the way of doing nothing, then we'd have a public relation policy that would include a ever-widening stream of people coming into AA and getting well. <clears throat> now we come to Tradition 12, and this one comprehends all of the traditions. Up to now, you have been listening to a recital, perhaps over long, of the protective value of the traditions to our society. We have been talking very much in terms of simply averting climate by taking prudent and unusual means and courses to do so. So now the question is posed by the listener, is there no more constructive or spiritual content to our traditions than simply the sum of our fears and anxieties and our efforts to protect ourselves from untoward evils and circumstances. Well, there certainly is. And all of these traditions have in them the elements of sacrifice. Sacrifice either by groups or by AA members. As we look back here, the common welfare tradition. People used to say, well, the drunk, he's the important guy. Well, surely he is. But how is he going to get well in any number if there is no fellowship? Therefore, the common welfare has to come first, and our individual welfare second. Uh, likewise, we who have been prone to power driving have to yield to the idea that we may be instructed by the group conscience. We have thrown aside all ambition 
to be prominent in the alcohol field as a society. Our members go into these fields as individual citizens, and there they should be. But the society says, no, we will cleave to a single purpose. We have sacrificed the opportunity of raising very large sums of money for this society and for others by adopting the tradition declining outside contributions. Those of us who had special ambitions to be professional workers, I don't mean service workers in an office, I mean face-to-face -face therapy for pay. These are legitimate ambitions, but not good enough. A professional class in AA might even lead to our destruction and certainly to our compromise. So professionalism out is out. Those of us who are power-ridden would like to unconsciously perhaps and sometimes consciously be more or less permanent governors of the destinies of AA. But now we see that our strength lies in letting go when our time comes. And this I recognize in myself. My time came some time ago, and our affairs have been under the management of our trustees almost without interference by me for these several years. And that's how it should be. But it represents a giving up, the sacrifice of Ambitions, many of which would be legitimate in the world around us, all in the interest not only of their survival, but in the effectiveness and the joyousness of the life that we find in it and cherish so much. In our public relations, we have run contrary to all experience in the modern world. In the modern world, everything is proceeding upon the merits or demerits of highly publicized figures. Everything was working in terms of friction and controversy. Everything is working in terms of haves and have-nots of large sums of money being transferred from one class to another. We do not decry these developments. We say that for our particular purpose, they're perilous. And so we think that it would be prudent to leave them alone. So there is a sacrificial quality that we do not conform to our traditions merely because we must to avoid personal calamity. We defer to these traditions because they seem right in principle and because we actually want them for ourselves. That while other courses might be good, for us this would be the best. In our case, the good could be very often the actual enemy of the best. Now then, I'd like to tell you a final anecdote, uh, which is a bit self-serving. I've had a certain amount of reluctance to speak about it. But I would like to draw attention to the fact that Dr. Bob and I began to recognize in the late 1940s that we had a special responsibility to set an example in the matter of the anonymity. That anon the conformity with anonymity was not merely a compliance with the injunction that we should not have our full names and pictures published uh, throughout the world. It was more than an avoidance of our names being made public, that it would extend also to the acceptance of 
special distinguishment and honors. This came up in this sort of conversation between Dr. Bob and I began toward nearly the close of his life. He was fatally afflicted. This is well known. I was back and forth between here and Akron a great deal. He was, however, much up and around much of the time. And on this day, we sat talking, and he said, you know, I want to show you something, something that moves me very much in a way, and something, of course, which to me, I wouldn't say so to the would-be donors, has a sort of a comical a aspect. And anyway, let me, let me get your reaction. So he came and spread out on the floor a blueprint, which was a drawing of a medium-sized mausoleum in which he and Anne could repose when they were over the hill. And Dr. Bob looked at me and told about some of the people coming up and thinking that this sort of thing was needed because this occurred with other celebrated people and so forth. And, of course, he had declined. And he turned to me and with that priceless grin of his, said, Bill, I think you and I ought to get buried like other folks. <laughs> well, this set us thinking, did we have some further obligation to this tradition of anonymity? And up to this point, there had been little nibbles that um, he had some, I'd had some, uh, lesser universities, smaller ones that offered degrees of various kinds and well, we'd kind of turned those down as a matter of course. But then we began to think, doesn't the tradition extend, extend to this public honor business? Doesn't it extend to the acceptance of no rewards, even posthumous? And then Dr. Baum died, and he... And Anne were then buried like other folks. She had been for a time. And pretty soon, a new set of temptations began to develop with me. Uh, Time magazine, some years ago, asked for a number of us to come over from the office. And I was included, of course. And they took us upstairs for a long, long lunch. And... These people were top figures over there, and they listened to the AA story, and they said, well, now we've given you folks good treatment, and we propose to keep it up, but now we would like, Bill, to have a biographical of you, and we would like to make this a cover paper. And let us tell you, before you say no, that if you make it a cover story, if you make it a cover story, it will enormously increase the impact of the piece a dozen times, maybe, over what the same piece without the cover was. And that our circulation is something like 12 million. Now, we would like to do the story of AA hung on a biographical state of you. And I said about the anonymity. Oh, no, we're quite aware of that. We're going to keep that. You just had your head turned away from the camera. There should be hardly side view that ball might nice show a little, but we'll stay within the rules and regulations. <laughs> well, I must confess that this proposal was a puzzle. I can honestly say that I didn't feel especially a perfect tempted by the lure of the flesh and blood of the biographical pyramid. It said it didn't seem right that this, that I should cooperate in such an effort. As for the anonymity, yes, they keep that, but then I began to wonder if what the effect would be on the future. If I began giving sketches of this sort of myself to public media, even with my head turned, 
uh, once uh, Papa was out of the way and gone west, would other people say, well, the old man off, uh, almost did it, so I'll give him my biography and full face on from here. In other words, it would open the door separately. The power driving people are the future. People just like me. Now, this is very hard to define because declinations meant to death to some, and it meant to prolong the illness of others. The impact of this thing could have been for months and brought in great numbers of people. So the saying no was something that people wrote nice about. And I did. I hope and believe that this was the right decision for A to. But again, for a long time, the sectors of the people who got and those whom I have recovered earlier has continued to haunt me. It was a question of making an estimate whether the nearby advantage of this would be of more value to more people than the advantage of an example that would include the acceptance of public honors in the air and in the tradition. And I have opted for the latter choice. It is the best that I can do. I leave it to you and to the future or whatever. It may be worse. So, in conclusion, dear folks, a thousand thanks for sitting with me and through the camera crowd out there. And, dear people, at great distance, please have my warmest affection and gratitude. And may God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.